this great big continent. Now, of course, not all the continent was under British control, but I think a lot of people saw that it was likely that the British slash American influence would expand westward over time. It already, it already was beginning to. Yeah, I really like that. It makes sense. And it also says, hey, if you got a big navy like the British does, then you can violate all sorts of things. And I also like how this seems to take some of the Enlightenment idealism wind out of his sails. And then he tries to argue some real politic here. But then other forms of colonialism. Hey, you need to control the Philippines or the Caribbean. That's good. Control Canada. That's bad. So you could find some, you know, things that don't quite line up there, but I like some of his real politic that works in. So I believe you were saying that there was a battle that we have to discuss, although it doesn't quite merit its own episode to focus on. But where are we going to with this? Yeah, it's it's worthy of mention because it's going to kind of set the course of the war for the next several years. Before we get to that, though, Scott, let me close the book on Thomas Paine, just in case people are wondering what happens to him later. It's not like he writes common sense and then disappears, <laughs> goes into hiding or something. Uh, he's going to write another influential pamphlet later, uh, The Crisis, which we'll talk about a little bit later in a future episode. He actually ends up on... Um, with the Continental Army, he ends up uh, marching with Washington for a while as a volunteer. He's not even in the army. He just goes to help out and do whatever he can. Later, uh, he he seems to get in trouble everywhere he goes. He, he has a hard time running his finances and, and just making a living. He ends up in France, and he becomes a big supporter of the revolution there, not surprisingly. Uh, he writes pamphlets there, and of course that revolution goes in a very different direction. So we we're not going to go into that. But uh, so Payne ends up really penniless and, and dies. I don't have the year in front of me, but he dies in obscurity, in poverty, and and is really forgotten by many Americans. And I, I think it is worthy that we do honor his contribution to the American Revolution. But as I said earlier, I would not quite elevate him to the level of a, of a Jefferson or a Washington or an Adams or anything like that. But he certainly, again, the, the impact of common sense cannot be overstated. We're going to see some other founding fathers wash up before all this is over, maybe in the epilogue episode. So Thomas Paine will be in good company or bad company, depending on how you define it. Exactly. All right. So the battle, we... Um, we have talked everything so far that we've talked about militarily has been in Massachusetts. And in fact, so far, everything, well, except for the Quebec, that was, I, I, I forgot about that. I have a brief senior moment there, Scott, <laughs> but, but, uh, but everything was in the North. Okay. We can definitely say that everything was either in Massachusetts or New York state slash Maine slash Canada, but we haven't talked about the South hardly at all. Now, the British leaders believed that there were a very large number of loyalists in the South, and they wanted to help them, of course. They, they thought, well, if we can stir up these loyalists, we can uh, make sure that the revolution doesn't really go anywhere in the South. Maybe it'll fizzle out, and then we can isolate Massachusetts and the northern colonies and just kind of bottle it up and nip it in the bud. So in, in regard to this, they sent an expeditionary force to Cape Fear, North Carolina, which would be under the command of General Henry Clinton. He's one of the three major generals that arrived uh, when Gage was still in charge uh, back in 1775. Clinton was told that when he and his force arrived, they would be greeted by a large loyalist force. Now, I should say there were quite a few loyalists in, in uh, the southern colonies, but perhaps not as many as the British thought. Case in point. So Clinton goes down to Cape Fear, North Carolina, and there was no loyalist force <laughs> at all. Uh, they didn't make it. They had been defeated by patriots on their way to Cape Fear. So they tried to get there, but it, it, it didn't work. So Clinton says, okay, so much for our welcoming committee. Let's go somewhere else. So he decides to attack Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston was the, by far the largest city in the South, the major port of the South. And in fact, it's one of the largest cities in the entire colony. Uh, on all the 13 colonies. It's hard to believe today because today Charleston, uh, it's a beautiful city, but it's not very big. I think it has a couple hundred thousand. It's it's just, it's dwarfed by cities like New York and Philadelphia and Boston and others. But at the time it was a major city. So they thought, well, let's go down and take Charleston and then we can establish a, a beachhead, so to speak, a base there. And then we can uh, 
hopefully get the South on our side and, and suppress the rebellion in the South. Washington learned of Clinton's intent to go down there and attack Charleston, so he sent General Charles Lee to Charleston to survive, supervise construction of defenses. We're going to have a lot more to say about Lee in the future, but for now, uh, he's going down to Charleston. He's going to beef up the defense and hopefully hold off the British. Now, the British assault force had about 2,900 soldiers and seamen, so it, it's a pretty good-sized force. Um, when they arrived... On June 4th, not July 4th, but June 4th, 1776, the British were greeted by a sturdy fort on Sullivan's Island. And uh, that's one of the islands that's near Charleston. It, it was called Fort Sullivan. Later, it was renamed Fort Moultrie. And Fort Moultrie is still there to this day. You can go see it. I've seen it. It's it's pretty nice, little, impressive little fort, well-preserved. But anyway, so here's the fort. The fort guarded the narrow channel into Charleston Harbor. And many other forts were built as well. Well, the British Navy started blasting away at the fort, but its defenders, led by William Moultrie, uh, hence the name of the fort later, William Moultrie holds firm. And it's interesting, Scott, that this fort was made of spongy palmetto wood. We all, at least anybody who knows anything about South Carolina knows that the flag, for example, has uh, one big tree on it. That's a palmetto tree, kind of like a palm tree, but slightly different. And it's called the Palmetto State. So... The, again, the wood of this tree is pretty spongy, so when these cannonballs would hit there, they would just kind of go bonk, you know, boink, and go right back off. It wasn't like really hard wood that would get shattered and turned into lots of deadly splinters and spikes and things like that. They must have a lot of give if they can repel that back. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it was a rubber ball hitting, <laughs> you know. We're not getting into Looney Tunes physics here where it stretches back 20 feet and then shoots back the cannonball with equal force, yeah. Right. No, but it, they would kind of just hit it and go thud and, and not cause that much damage most of the time. So three days later, on June 7th, the infantry, commanded by Lord Cornwallis, and that's another person that's going to have a big future. Cornwallis is a, uh, I think he's a major general at this point, uh, the third highest ranking general. Uh, he might be brigadier. I don't know. But anyway, he, he was sent there. He was under Clinton. Cornwallis landed on what they thought was Sullivan's Island, but it turned out to be a different island. <laughs> Wrong island. <laughs> they, they were a little bit uh, mixed up on their geography. It, this island is called Long Island, not to be confused with Long Island by New York. That'll be next week <laughs> or ne next episode. Uh, but this Long Island was, it was in the Charleston vicinity and on the coast. And it was separated from Sullivan's Island, which is where they wanted to go so they could knock out the fort they were separated by a deep channel. So the infantry couldn't get to the fort due to stiff resistance by the Americans. They're trying to get across this channel. They're wading through pretty deep water, and the Americans are just picking them off. So they have to give it up. Uh, on the 28th of June, this is three weeks later, the British fleet tries to slip by the fort. But again, they take heavy losses. Uh, the, there's a lot of guns, American guns on the shore there. Three ships run aground on a shoal in the harbor entrance, and two of the ships were able to get away, but one was stuck, and the British had to burn it. So they burned their own ship, but they had to do that. Otherwise, the Americans would get a hold of it, and the American Navy would get a very valuable acquisition. <laughs> so after all this, um, the inability for the infantry to get to Sullivan, Fort Sullivan, later Fort Moultrie, and, and the, the Navy's not having much better luck, Clinton calls off the attack, and the British force returned north. So Charleston fights off the first attempt to invade it. The Americans only suffered 10 dead and 22 wounded. And the victory, again, as we said, it's not a huge battle, but it provided a much-needed morale boost for the Patriots. Uh, they needed a win, especially after Bunker Hill. It also, although Bunker Hill was, uh, a, I guess, a... A successful loss? Is that an oxymoron, Scott? A success? It was a good loss. We have those weird turns of phrases. Yeah, we'll, we'll let it slide. Yeah. All right. So, but this was a, an honest to goodness win. They they fought off a British invasion, turned them around, sent the British back, packing back to the north, and it increased support for independence among the people of South Carolina, and it ensured that the South would, for now at least, would be safe from British attack. The British will not try to go down south again for at least two more years. And it provided valuable military experience for Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter. Those are two guys that are going to have a big future, and we will mention them uh, later 
Although, Scott, you wanted to mention a few things about Marion right well, now. Well, am I giving things away if I talk about how Marion distinguishes himself at Soul of an Island the next month? Or sh- should that be I safer? I don't think. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, hey, I'm proud to say in the last episode, I mentioned I'm from the town of Knoxville, named after Henry Knox. Knoxville, Iowa is located in Marion County, named after Francis Marion. So whatever bureaucrat who was trying to figure out all the names of Iowa counties in the 1840s must have been a big Revolutionary War history buff. Oddly enough, there's also a county called Kasuth. That's how we pronounce it. But it's named after Kolsuth Lajos, the hero of the 1840s Hungarian Revolution. So you find a lot of weird named counties all over our great state of America and people they come after. Anyway, one thing to mention about Francis Marion, he is known as a swamp fox, and he's fictionalized slightly by Mel Gibson in The Patriot. But where he distinguished himself is around this time when he participates in the capture of Fort Johnson and distinguishes himself during the Battle of Sullivan Island on June 28th in 1776. Marion, he reportedly ordered the last shot of the engagement, and it, this blast killed two British officers and three sailors. And about 200 British sailors are killed or wounded, where the same kind of lopsided losses that we saw here in this battle that James described, where the South Carolina militia only suffers 38 casualties and other victories, keeps the British out of South Carolina for three years. Marion gets promoted to lieutenant colonel, and he's given command of Fort Sullivan. So this is prestigious because the fort's the presumed focal point of any future British attack. So these actions, I think, help funnel British activity more northward and I think makes things more manageable for the Patriots in the years ahead. Oh, yeah, definitely. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. All right, ready to move on to our next major topic? Yes. So we're going to look at another major document. Can y'all guess what it is, listeners? Hmm. What could it be? Seventeen. We're getting down to 1776, July 1776. This is making some of the people in our virtual class wake up because their brain tells them this is a question that they can answer. So yeah, I see some shifting in seats in the class. This is on the test. <laughs> oh, everybody looks up. All right. So Congress now is moving slowly but surely. Actually, it's going to speed up here toward independence. In May of 1776, Congress gave a general sanction for the colonies to form new governments and declared the crown's control over the colonies to be totally suppressed. So one by one, the colonies did this. They they all declare, uh, gradually, one by one, they declare that the royal government is null and void. It has no authority over the colony, which is really true in most of the colonies anyway. By this point, the royal governors are either gone or maybe they're on a ship you know, just off the shore or they're in just one little town, but that's all they have control over. So uh, the colonies make their own colonial governments, loyal to the independent, or at least loyal to the patriot cause. And in many cases, some of the colonies declare themselves independent even before the Continental Congress does that. Um, Congress, the, the new governments that I just mentioned, the colonial governments, they send delegates to Congress, new ones, and they urge Congress of their to declare the colonies independent. Now, that's not all of them, obviously. I don't want you all to think that, oh, all 13 colonies just all of a sudden decided to, to cut the ties with Britain. Quite the contrary. There will be several that are going to be very resistant to that. But more and more are getting on the independence bandwagon. Finally, in June, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia offers a resolution that would declare independence, and it passes. Scott, have you seen the movie seven or the musical 1776? Oh, yeah. That came out in the 70s, which. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a beloved tool in the kit of any high school teacher that wants in a yes. civics class. Listener, if you haven't, some of y'all are probably pretty young and this is way before your time, but you've got to check this out, you know, see if you can get it from Netflix or rent it online or something. It, it's not intended to be historically accurate necessarily, but it's just fun. It, it's just a lot of fun. And you just haven't lived until you've seen Ben Franklin sing, singing and dancing. <laughs> It's funny, you know, Ben Franklin suffered from gout and sometimes he had to be physically carried from place <laughs> to place. And yet he gets up and starts, he, you know, doing a little tap dance with, along with Jefferson and Adams. But 
Hamilton the musical would not exist without seven. 